Due to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of sex and murder that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. At the end of the 1970s and into the 1980s, Los Angeles' Laurel Canyon was a musician's paradise. Everyone from Joni Mitchell to Neil Young to the Eagles lived around the woodsy neighborhood, writing songs that would soon become classics. But Wonderland Avenue had one two-story stucco house that stood out like a sore thumb. A rotating cast of random visitors came and went at all hours of the night. Most of them seemed intoxicated. Neighbors repeatedly heard the sounds of people screaming. The house was rented by a woman named Joy Miller. Joy was the 46-year-old ex-wife of a powerful Beverly Hills lawyer, and she had two daughters. She was addicted to heroin, and she had started selling the drug in order to fuel her habit. Joy's house had quickly become the headquarters of a small-time gang known as the Wonderland Gang, at least until the day that everything came crashing down. On the afternoon of July 1st, 1981, police got a tip that someone was calling for help inside the rental house. When they walked inside, they found the bodies of the Wonderland gang. Joy and three others had been savagely beaten to death. There was only one woman still alive. When police found her, she was screaming for help and barely hanging on to consciousness. But when they asked what happened, the woman couldn't remember. The events of that day were a mystery even to the only living witness. This is our only episode on the Wonderland murders. This week, we'll cover why four people were brutally bludgeoned to death in Los Angeles in 1981, and why their killers never saw justice. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. John Holmes was born in Ohio in 1944. Raised by a devout Baptist mother and an alcoholic father, his childhood was rocky from the beginning. As soon as he was old enough, he ran away to join the Army. By 19, John had left the Army and found his way to Los Angeles. He was a skinny, unassuming guy with a mop of hair and a charming smile. Because of his father's alcoholism, he had yet to touch drugs or alcohol. According to some who knew him around that time, John was a sweet kid, but not especially bright. He married a woman named Sharon and settled down for an unassuming life in the California suburbs. At least until one day in 1968, when Sharon came home to find her husband naked in the bathroom, holding a tape measure. Oh, John, what are you doing in here? Honey, would you look at this? 13 inches. I suppose you're proud of that, are you? But what's it even matter? Who are you planning to show? The whole world. This thing is going to make me a star. What do you think? I think you should stick with ambulance driving, John. But John didn't listen. He found an open casting call for porn actors in Hollywood and immediately headed over to audition. The producers initially wrote him off as a skinny kid without much to offer, but the moment he undressed, they knew he was going to make them rich. He debuted his signature character, Johnny Wad, in 1971. Johnny Wad was a hard-boiled detective in films like Tropic of Passion, Liquid Lips, and puss o John Holmes quickly became a star, no matter what his wife, Sharon, thought of his new career. While the adult entertainment industry was thriving at the time, the law heavily looked down upon producing porn in Los Angeles. One night, John was arrested for quote-unquote, pimping and pandering. Did my wife pay my bail yet? No. She phoned and said we could feel free to keep you a little longer. I don't think she much likes your line of work. What a charming wife I have. Suppose that means I'm stuck here. That's right. Unless... Unless? Well, you know an awful lot about what's going on in this town. And if you helped us out, we could make sure you stay out of trouble. 
Detective, I like the way you think. Suddenly, John found himself with a side job, working as a police informant. He started shooting adult films during the day and then feeding information about the very same productions to the LAPD by night. John embraced this role, telling his detective contact about directors, producers, and sources of funding. He even revealed shooting locations and the places where actors were scheduled to be picked up to go to the set, leading to many arrests. He saw himself as Johnny Wad in real life, and as his career grew throughout the 1970s, so did his ego. He constantly told stories about his sexual escapades. He often bragged about how he'd been paid money to turn tricks for wealthy women in Europe, and even famously claimed that he'd had sex with a total of 14,000 women. He loved to tell these stories so much that he forgot most of them were made up, and his managers and friends had to remind him. But one person didn't mind listening to John's endless tales, a businessman and entrepreneur named Eddie Nash. At the time, Nash was nearly as infamous in L.A. as John himself. He owned nightclubs all across the city and was well known for throwing extravagant parties at his Studio City home. But money couldn't buy what John had, and Eddie loved having John Holmes in his circle. Say, Tanner, I'd like you to meet my very good friend, John Holmes. But you might know him better as Johnny Y. Oh, yes, I've seen a lot of your movies. But you weren't the one I was looking for. Oh, come on. I have such a pretty face. Yeah, John Holmes is most famous for his face. <laughs> now come with me, John. There are some more people who are just dying to meet you. John was a hit at Eddie's parties. But for all of his charisma, John had a dark side. At times, he was moody and demanding and even interrupted shooting and refused to work if something upset him. And over time, John became increasingly volatile. Although he didn't drink as a young man, once he was in the porn business, all bets were off. He began drinking and smoking marijuana, and by 1976, John discovered cocaine. It turned his occasional dark side much darker. That same year, the 32-year-old met a 15-year-old girl named Dawn. He seduced and groomed her, beginning a long and violent relationship that she tried and failed to escape from multiple times. His addiction escalated until he was freebasing cocaine nearly constantly. At one point, rumors spread that he was smoking nearly $1,500 worth of drugs every day. His entire life had revolved around sex, but his new drug habit rendered him unable to perform. He soon became unreliable on set and producers stopped wanting to hire him. Without work, he ran out of money, but his drug habit was still going strong. To fund his habit, John sold off just about everything he owned and then started stealing from his wife, Sharon. He ran up debt on all of his credit cards, buying big ticket items and reselling them for cash. When this didn't hold him over, he started pulling small time robberies. At the end of the 1970s, he was even pimping Dawn out to Eddie Nash in exchange for cash and cocaine. But it was never enough. By 1981, John was desperate. He needed money for cocaine every day, and he was running out of options. He was deep in debt to a lot of people, including the Wonderland Gang. The Wonderland Gang, headquartered at Joy Miller's stucco house in Laurel Canyon, had their own struggles. All five gang members were addicted to drugs and their business was spiraling out of control. But in June of 1981, the Wonderland Gang contacted John about an opportunity. It's a simple job. Just go to a house, hang out for a while, and make sure the door is unlocked for us. Whatever we take, drugs, money, whatever, you get an even split. Yeah, 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 sounds uh, simple enough. Uh, Appreciate you bringing me into this, man. I, I know I owe you, but hopefully after this we can call it all good. We'll see about that. Right, sure. Cool. Uh, whose house are we hitting again? That's the best part. You know the place already. Eddie Nash. John? Right, right. Uh, I'll think about it. 
John was nervous about robbing his own friend, but he was getting more desperate by the day. So he agreed to the gang's plan. Coming up, the Wonderland gang attempts a risky robbery. On the night of June 29, 1981, 31-year-old former porn star John Holmes headed over to Studio City in Los Angeles to meet his old friend, nightclub owner Eddie Nash. But this wasn't a normal catch-up. John was addicted to cocaine and desperate for money, and that night, he arrived at Eddie's house with a plan to rob him. John? No, hello? Come on in. What brings you here? Uh, I thought I'd drop it on my old friend Eddie. How you been? I've been good, man. Great. Say, uh, yeah, it's nice out. Let's leave the door open, shall we? All right, John. Out with it. What do you want? I'm not loaning you anything. I told you I'm done with that. I'm here to catch up with my old friend. And I have $400. Maybe you can help me score? I'm looking to buy. John Holmes with money? That's a surprise. Especially when you owe me... How much is it again? Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm good for that. Come on. I'm in talks about a new Johnny Wad movie. For real. That's good news, John. I'm glad to hear your uh, performance has improved. But why don't we call this $400 a down payment on your debts? Once that's paid off, we can talk about finding you some... Uh, listen, Eddie, maybe if you just sell me something tonight, I can find you a date for Friday night. I'm listening. John stayed at Eddie's house for six hours, freebasing cocaine the whole time. When he left in the middle of the night, John made sure to leave the sliding door open. He drove straight to the Wonderland house to give the all clear. Now is the time to stage the robbery. But John wasn't the only one who'd spent the night doing drugs. Three members of the gang, Billy Deverell, Ron Lanius, and Tracy McCourt, had passed out from a bender of their own. By the time the gang was ready, it was morning. Eddie could have easily noticed that his door was open and shut it already. So the Wonderland gang sent John back to Eddie's house once again. They followed in their own car. When John pulled up to Eddie's house, he saw that the door was still open. So he turned around and signaled to the gang. He slowed down, rolled down his window, and gave Tracy McCourt a wave. Unfortunately, it was morning by then, and anyone looking out the window could have seen him, including Eddie Nash himself. Moments later, three members of the Wonderland gang burst into Eddie's Studio City home. They were dressed in stolen cop uniforms and immediately yelled at Eddie and his bodyguard, Greg, that they were under arrest. Freeze! Hands where I can see them! Please, officers, I I don't know what you're... Ow! Ow! These aren't cops, boss. What do you mean? And stop talking, both of you! Sit down over there! They tied Eddie up with duct tape and put a pillowcase over his head. But these weren't exactly master criminals. They bumbled through the house looking for things to steal. One of the gang members accidentally fired a gun and grazed Eddie's bodyguard in the back with a bullet. But the Wonderland gang still made it out of Eddie's house with cocaine, quaaludes, heroin, and piles of cash and jewelry. All told, the score was worth around a million dollars. When they got back to their house in Laurel Canyon, John Holmes took his cut and went on his way. But unfortunately for John, his night of crime was far from over. Back in Studio City, Eddie Nash was furious. He had no idea who just robbed him, but he was going to find out and get even. He uncovered a secret stash of cocaine that the gang had missed and burned through it while he decided what to do next. His anger festered for two days until July 1st when Eddie's bodyguard ran into John Holmes. John was wearing one of Eddie's stolen rings. Just like that, all the pieces fell into place. Eddie immediately headed out to get his revenge. That's a nice ring you have on, John. What? This whole thing? Family uh, heirloom. Does that look like a family heirloom, Greg? Not to me. 
I think I've seen that watch somewhere before. Like on my own wrist. That's right, boss. I've seen it on your wrist, too. Is that right? Strange. Yeah, I must have just mixed up our rings when I came over the other day. You know what else happened the other day, John? I got robbed. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that. <laughs> no, of course not. That's interesting. Tell them what else is interesting, Greg. We know where your wife lives and works and shops, John. We've got eyes on her right now. Fine. It was the Wonderland gang. They took your stuff and I helped them, but please don't hurt my wife. The Wonderland gang didn't know that John had told Eddie everything, and John didn't know what he was getting into. Around 3 a.m. on July 1st, 1981, the door to the house on Wonderland Avenue burst open. Some loud, raucous sounds woke a few of the nearby neighbors, but they'd gotten used to strange noises from the Wonderland gang house. It took a full 12 hours before someone realized they should call the cops. Are you the woman who called it in? Well, I noticed the door was open. It was... It was a little unusual, even for that house. And those pit bulls running around over there, they usually manage to keep the dogs tied up. I see. So you walked into the house because the door was open? No! I certainly wouldn't go into that house if I could help it. But I heard yelling. It was a woman. And I thought she was saying, help me. And this was the first time you heard her screams? Not exactly. I woke up in the middle of the night last night. It must have been 4 or 5 a.m. and I heard yelling from next door. What took you so long to call it in? If I called the police every time I heard yelling from that house, well, let's just say it's not the first time there have been disturbances. But nothing like this. The police entered the house, but the neighbor's story did nothing to prepare them for what they found. The bodies of the four victims, Joy Audrey Miller, Billy Deverell, Barbara Richardson and Ron Lanius had been so brutally beaten that they were rendered unrecognizable. Police could only identify them by fingerprint. As it turned out, some of these officers had witnessed the aftermath of the infamous Manson family murders 12 years earlier. And they still dubbed the Wonderland murders the most gruesome crime scene they had ever seen. The blood of four bodies covered the entire house. A fifth victim was somehow still alive. 25-year-old Susan Lanius had been waiting in the house for 12 hours with severe head trauma and a severed finger, crying for help until police finally arrived. She was immediately rushed to the hospital. Then the police searched the house. Despite the brutality of the crime scene, there was no sign of forced entry. It seemed like someone had unlocked the door for the killer someone who knew their way around the house. And when they noticed a bloody handprint on the wall above one of the victims, they had an idea who that person might be. It belonged to one-time porn star, John Holmes. Up next, John becomes the number one suspect. Now, back to the story. On July 2nd, 1981, four people associated with the Wonderland gang were discovered brutally beaten to death in a Los Angeles home. A bloody handprint pointed them towards a suspect, 37-year-old John Holmes. But there was someone else worth questioning. His name was David Lind, and he was the only member of the Wonderland gang who wasn't at the house that night. The police wanted to know why. Where were you the night of July 1st? I was visiting friends in the San Fernando Valley. I was at their place. Can one of them vouch for your presence there that night? I mean, we were pretty out of our minds on, well, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that night. But one of them probably remembers something. Great. Well, can you tell us anything about what happened with your friends in the days before July 1st? Do you know anyone who might want to hurt them? Uh, I can't think of anything. I'm going to ask that question again. Can you think of anyone who might have wanted to hurt your friends? All right, all right. There was this one thing that happened the other day. 
David told the police about the robbery at Eddie Nash's house. Just like that, a story started forming, one that tied a former porn star to a gruesome murder. The LAPD found John on July 10, 1981, and locked him in protective custody in a fancy hotel in downtown Los Angeles. They planned to find out what he knew about that night and who else was with him. But John didn't feel like talking. Eddie Nash's threats on Sharon's life still rang loudly in John's head. He refused to provide the police with any information about the night of the murders. For some reason, they released him three days later. Unsurprisingly, John immediately skipped town. He took his young mistress, 21-year-old Dawn, and went on the run for five months. They traveled to Montana and then to Florida, but since John had crossed state lines, the FBI were now after him. To pay for their fugitive lifestyle, John started stealing cars outside of motels. Then he forced Dawn into sex work. But by December of 1981, Dawn had finally had enough. She slipped away from John and headed straight to the FBI. According to Dawn, this was the first time she had ever really said no to John. It was also the last time she ever saw him. John was tried for the murders in 1982. The prosecution pointed out the position of John's handprint above one of the bodies. Because of this, they said he likely participated in bludgeoning at least one victim. John didn't testify, and his defense team didn't call any witnesses to the stand. Eddie Nash's threats to Sharon still scared him, and he simply wasn't interested in making a public testimony, as long as Eddie and his people were roaming free. This left the defense with one strategy. To position John as a victim in the murders, someone acting under duress to save his own life. Because the jury must find a defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, they hope to cast enough uncertainty on John's role in the event to absolve him. But it was a tricky story to sell to the jury. Somehow, it worked. The jury deliberated and came back with a ruling. While they believed that John was at the crime scene and had even unlocked the door to the Wonderland house on that night of July 1st, the jury wasn't sure that he actually participated in the killing. John was acquitted. The authorities weren't done with him, though. They could tell that John knew something about the killings, and they wanted to know what it was. After the acquittal, he was held in the county jail for nearly four months in contempt of court for his refusal to tell them what he knew. He finally relented, but only after Eddie had been imprisoned for separate drug charges— John testified, but not publicly. His statement to the authorities remains sealed to this day. When John got out of jail in 1982, he tried to get back into the porn industry, but he soon discovered that a friend had started a porn production company using John's name and selling his old films. John had signed away the rights to the films a long time ago, and he was in no position to argue but his old friend decided to give him a job anyway in a gesture of goodwill. In the 1980s, John Holmes started working for a company that bore his own name. But instead of being grateful, he immediately embezzled as much money as he could. John Holmes died in March of 1988 of complications from AIDS. Just weeks after his death, his wife Sharon opened up to the press. As the LA Times wrote... In a recent interview with The Times, Sharon Holmes described for the first time the story her husband told her less than three weeks after the July 1st killings. John Holmes recounted how he led three thugs to the tightly secured drug house on Wonderland Avenue, escorted them in, and stood by as they bludgeoned the five people inside, spattering Holmes with blood. One woman survived the attack. But Sharon's report was only a piece of the new information the LAPD had been waiting for. More evidence came in the form of a testimony from a man named Scott Thorson, who was once Liberace's boyfriend. Scott was awaiting sentencing for an unrelated drug crime and offered up information about Eddie Nash to help his own case. Scott bought cocaine from Eddie Nash on many occasions and recalled being at his house on the day after the robbery. Scott told the police that Eddie was furious and vowed to get revenge on the people who had robbed him. 
Scott wholeheartedly believed that he was serious, and that was good enough for the LAPD. In 1990, Eddie Nash and Greg Diles were arrested and tried separately in an unusual double trial. This meant that there were two separate juries, one for each defendant, but the witnesses generally testified only once. Occasionally, an entire jury was cleared from the room if they were not supposed to hear a particular witness's testimony. But as the trial was wrapping up, it's alleged that Eddie Nash cornered a juror in the hallway. Hey, juror number 12. I don't think I'm supposed to be talking to you. We can make an exception to the rule just this once, don't you think? Hey, whoa, whoa! I have a gun in this pocket and $50,000 in the other. Up to you which one you want, understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. After all the testimony concluded, the juries went off to deliberate. To everyone's surprise except Eddie's, it was a hung jury, 11 to 1. It was declared a mistrial, and Eddie Nash and Greg Diles both walked free. They were tried a year later in 1991 to the same outcome. Years passed, but the L.A. District Attorney's Office didn't forget about the crime. Nine years later, they tried again. They arrested Eddie, this time on racketeering charges. He was 72 years old and his health was failing him. Finally, he entered a guilty plea. When he was sentenced in 2001, it wasn't for the murders exactly. The murder charges were included in a host of other crimes. However, he was only sentenced to 37 months in prison for all of his charges combined. Through a series of technicalities and loopholes in the justice system, a full account of the facts as we know them was never provided to a jury at a trial, and they were never given a full opportunity to weigh the case on its merits. Some believe that Eddie merely sent some of his people to recover the property by any means necessary. That Greg Diles or John Holmes or someone else entirely was the true culprit. Others believe that Eddie committed the murders himself. We may never know exactly what happened at the Wonderland House that night in 1981, but in 40 years of investigation, it seems we have a pretty good idea about who should have been convicted. From all the evidence available, I think it's safe to say that Eddie Nash either committed the murders himself or directly ordered someone else to do it. Based on how many times this has gone to trial, I have to agree. No other story makes any sense. Eddie Nash had both the motive of revenge and the opportunity of a connection to John Holmes. I think he did it. In any case, the victims of the murders were all hardened criminals, and the media tended to focus on them as a monolith or minimize them as lowlifes and addicts. But four human beings met a violent, gruesome end on July 1st, 1981, and that's a fate that no one deserves, no matter who they are. <laughs> 